done. Um, as I said before, the question is, is intercession a ministry? Is it a separate distinct ministry like evangelism, like uh, being a pastor, uh, like being uh, an, an exhorter? Or is it a ministry by itself? And this is a question we're going to answer. So um, in order to get to the, the answer may be simple. It may be yes or no, right? But to get to the answer, um, I'm going to take you through a journey because I had to do a lot of studying, a lot of um, contemplating scriptures to get to um, the truth and what the Bible actually says, all right? So I'm going to take you along on the journey that I took. And on that journey, we're going to meander a little bit. We're going to go through some different areas. But at the end of it, what I want to do is give you the information so that you can make up your own mind. That's my that's my purpose here today. Not just to answer the question, yes or no, but to take you on a journey, a journey of discovery through the Bible, through the scriptures. And so at the end of it, you will have enough information to make up your own mind and decide for yourself is intercession in ministry or not, all right? So that's how we're going to do it today. So I thought, once I began to consider this question, I thought the most obvious thing to, to, to begin to study is what is a ministry? If we're going to ask the question, is intercession a ministry? Then I think the first question is, what is a ministry? So that's where I began my study. So buckle up, put on your seatbelts, right? and let's, let's take a ride. What is a ministry? A ministry is a call from God. That is what a ministry is. When you talk about a ministry, it's intercession. A ministry, it's a call from God. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. You see, every believer has a specific purpose, they are called to accomplish, and for which they have been given specific gifts, abilities, and resources, right? But apart from the specific call of God, every believer also has a general ministry, a corporate ministry, which we will get into in a little while. But for now, I want to begin this study by sort of, um, you know, getting us to understand what a ministry is. It is a call from God. It is something that God has purposed each person that he has saved, given them a job to do, all right? A specific a work that he wants them to accomplish. And that is what a ministry is, a call from God. The, the, the problem is many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> the Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? Uh, Matthew twenty two fourteen says, so the last shall be first, and the, uh, um, the last shall be first and the first last for many be called, but few chosen. Now the word call is the Greek word kletos, and it means invited to an office, invited to occupy an office or to function in an office. Chosen is the word eklektos, and it means selected or elected, all right? So to be called is to be invited to function in a particular office. To be chosen is to be selected to function in that office, right? So there's a difference. You could be called, but not chosen. It depends. Uh, the word first is the Greek word protos. It means first in rank, in influence, or honor. The word last is the word, word um, eschatos, eschatos, right? Uh, it means last in rank, the lowest grade or worth. So many Christians refuse to endure the training in order to be selected for ministry. Right. And that is sort of the main issue in why some people are called but not chosen to function in the ministry uh, in which they are called to function and to fulfill their purpose in life. Right. Because if you go for a secular job, OK, and it's an important job, it's something that is, is, is high profile and it's an area that you have not studied before. You have to go through training. There's orientation. You have to acclimatize yourself with the culture of the company you're going to work for, right? They have specific rules, specific procedures that you have to be acquainted with, and you have to go through a, a training process. And even after the initial training, whether it's a week, two weeks, a month, three months, whatever, there's going to be on-the-job training as you actually learn the job while you're performing it. So there's a long period of training in order to become proficient at any job. And guess what? Being a Christian, being a servant of God is a job. 
And most of us, I think, don't understand that most Christians have not come to the place where they, they understand that being a Christian, being a representative of the kingdom of God is a full-time job. All right? And again, we'll get into all of that. We'll get into some details, <coughs> excuse me, as we go forward. And we'll see the difference between your job and your vocation, okay? But being a Christian, being a representative of the kingdom of God is a full-time job for which you need to be trained. And the difficulties we go through, the trials, the testing, the temptations, that's our training. Many people ask the question, why is this Christian life so hard? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why am I serving God and my life is still so difficult? It's training. That's how God does his training. He allows trying, tempting, testing times, circumstances and situations to come to you to sharpen or to wrong, I'm using two different words, to sharpen or wronged off your character. <laughs> you can look at this, sharpening your character to become more like Christ or wronging off the rough edges to become more like Christ. Okay, so whether you say sharpen or wronged in, it's still the same thing we're talking about. Being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of the trying and testing times that you're going through the hard times, the difficult times, the things that God allow, the people that are in your life that may not be the best people for you. They may be people that are wounded, hurt, and betraying. You may have gone through uh, different challenges and, and, and different trials. In last week, we were looking at some really, really heavy stuff last week about people who are abused and so forth. And you may ask yourself, well, I'm a Christian. I'm serving God. Why is God allowing this to happen to me? Everything God does, he does in love because he cannot act contrary to his nature and character. And the Bible says God is love. So God is love. Everything he allows to come to you, he's doing it out of love. The Bible says that he will not give you more than you are able to bear, right? Even the apostle Paul had certain trying circumstances in his life and he asked God to take it away from him. God said, no, I'm gonna leave it, but I'm gonna give you enough grace to handle that situation. My grace is sufficient for you. And in your weakness, then am I strong? So sometimes God allows us to go through situations and um, those situations may seem to be uh, putting us in a position of weakness. But in our weakness, that's when God can show forth his mighty power much more clearer than otherwise. Because sometimes we get so accustomed to depending on ourselves, providing for ourselves, you know, and God is just a footnote in our mind. No, God wants to be center stage. He wants to be our all in all. He wants to be our everything, right? The first instinct should be to pray and seek the, the will of God, seek the guidance of Almighty God, lean on the, 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 the power of God, the ability of God. That's what he wants. He wants us to be Christ dependent, not self-dependent, okay? So many are called, few are chosen, and many of us refuse to go through the training in order to be selected or to be chosen for the ministry, for the call, for the purpose, why we are saved and why God have us on the earth. All right. Your vocation is supposed to be your calling. Again, a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't understand that. Right? Here's the thing. Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, I, therefore, Paul, of course, is speaking. The prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you are worthy of the vocation you are called. All right. So the word vocation here is the word classes, is the word calling, uh, invitation. It's the same thing we saw before. Your call, your ministry is your vocation, right? Now, the dictionary meaning of the word vocation is a person's employment or main occupation. A person's employment or main occupation. So really and truly, the thing that you have dedicated your life to, right, it's supposed to be your vocation. But I think a lot of Christians, they just uh, get a job, right? And they think that the job is their call, is their purpose in life. That's the main thing that they're supposed to be doing. And um, that's not really the way it's supposed to be, right? Your job, your main focus in life is supposed to be the thing that God has called you to perform, right? Now, sometimes we may, even like, like, like the Apostle Paul, we may be caught up in, a, uh, uh, let's say, a secular job just to pay the bills or whatever, right? And we know that we have our purpose, our ministry clearly defined, and they are two completely separate things. That might be a situation. Even the Apostle Paul was in that situation, right? If that's the case, then it's fine. You can have a regular job, 
and you can have your purpose, your call, your ministry, right? Uh, the call of, of God upon your life and you're doing that. If that's the case, then you need to have them completely divided and separate and know what is what. Let's read Acts 18.3 and this will give you a better understanding of what I'm trying to say. So because he, the Apostle Paul, was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. And even while he was preaching and teaching the word of God, he was making tents to pay his bills and support himself financially. <laughs> right? He was a tent maker by trade and he made tents. He was occupied. He had a day job. In other words, the apostle Paul had a day job. Here's the key. If you read the epistles that Paul wrote to the churches, okay, the epistle to the Romans, the Philippians, the Galatians, the Thess Thessalonians, uh, can you tell me any one of those epistles that he wrote? He, he began by greeting them by saying, uh, greetings from God the, God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ and from Paul the tent maker. <laughs> did he ever say that? He never did. Nowhere in scriptures will Paul ever introduce himself as Paul the tent maker. But that's what he did. That was his job. That was his trade. Right? He did that to support himself financially. No, 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 no. The apostle Paul understood that was just a means to an end. That he is living in a material world, right? The Bible says money answered all things. He needed to pay bills. He needed to eat. He needed a roof over his head. So he had a day job. At no point in time did Paul confuse himself into thinking that his job was his ministry. Never did. Many of us Christians are in that situation where we are confusing ourselves and we're thinking the job we're doing, that's our purpose, that's our call, that's what God will have us to do, All right? You have to be very careful. We have to be very careful to understand what is the purpose God has called me to and fulfill that purpose. And even if you have to have a day job, understand that is a means to an end. So the purpose of the day job is to get money to pay bills. That's not your purpose, All right? So what I'm saying is that, the ideal situation, the ideal situation would be that your job is your ministry. It is your vocation. The thing you're doing to pay your bills, right? That is your purpose in life. That's the ideal situation. That's where all of us would want to be. <laughs> right? That the passion, the thing that you have, the thing that you're consumed with, the thing that brings you joy, okay? And you're, you're equipped to do it, that job. That's your purpose and you're being paid to do it. All of us would love to be there, right? Not all of us are, right? So if, if, if that's your case, fantastic, wonderful, God bless you. But if not, and you have a day job and then you have a ministry, please don't confuse the two, right? That's the point of this slide here. Now, what does ministry look like in the kingdom of God? What does ministry look like, right? So we say a ministry is a call. Your ministry is your call, right? And the ideal situation would be that your ministry is also your vocation, your job. That would be the ideal situation, okay? Now we're going to ask the question, what does ministry look like in the kingdom of God? Acts one seventeen says, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Of course, they were speaking about Judas who had, you know, gone and done contrary stuff and he was no longer with them, right? My only purpose for quoting this verse is to get to the word ministry, that word is diakonia in the Greek, diakonia. And it simply means service, right? Service. Of course, like most Greek words, there will be many different connotations, but basically, fundamentally, it means service. So ministry is service. It's some area in which you can serve. Luke 10, 40 says, but Martha was distracted with much serving, Right. And most of us know we are familiar with the story. Jesus went to Lazarus, Mary and Martha's home and he sat there teaching. Mary sat at his feet and she was listening to Jesus. And Martha was in the kitchen preparing food. Right. Martha was in the kitchen preparing food. The Bible says Martha was distracted with much serving. That word serving, same Greek word, diakonia. Diakonia. So that was ministry. Right. That was a type of ministry that Martha was doing. Right now, Jesus did say that Mary chose the better part. Right, he didn't say Mary chose the good part and Martha chose the bad part. He didn't say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so what Martha was doing wasn't bad, it was good. 
It's just that Mary chose the better part. The better part was to sit and learn at Jesus' feet. That was better. But what Martha was doing was good. She was serving. She was involved in ministry. So we're asking the question, what is ministry? What does ministry look like in the kingdom of God? It could be as simple as preparing a meal. That could be ministry. That's service, right? Let's look at Acts eleven twenty nine. The disciples, each in accordance with his financial ability, decided to send relief to the brothers. So here we have some Christian brothers, some group, a group of Christians that were uh, broke. Right? They needed financial help. And others in a different place were financially um, uh, able to assist them. And they send relief. They send money, financial uh, aid to them. Guess what? That word relief, that is the same Greek word diakonia. That's ministry. Yeah. Giving is a ministry. Believe it or not, giving money, giving finances, supporting the kingdom of God financially is a ministry. Right? That's a type of ministry, serving the body of Christ. So I'm trying to show us that ministry can take on many different uh, formats, right? People can serve in many different areas and different methods, different ways, different categories, different classes of service. Acts 6.4 says, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, the ministry of the word. See, Peter here is, is qualifying ministry. We saw in Luke 10, 40, Martha was preparing food and that was a type of ministry, a type of service. We saw in Acts eleven twenty nine 29, some disciples who were financially, financially well off sent money to assist other disciples that did not have. And the giving of that money, that financial aid was a type of ministry. We just saw that. But here, Peter is making a distinction and he's saying, we, the apostles, all right? We are going to give ourselves continually to pray and to the ministry of the word, not just ministry, but the ministry of the word. And this is what I wanted to bring home to you guys today. <clears throat> When most Christians say the word ministry and they use the word ministry in discussion, they think that the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, that's ministry. And that, that alone is ministry. <laughs> no, that's just the ministry of the word. See the distinction here in Acts 4, 6, 4? The ministry of the word. Because those five ministries, those five offices, their chief aim or purpose is to teach or preach the word of God. You get it? To teach or preach the word of God. <clears throat> that's the purpose of those ministries, to teach or preach the word of God. So that's why Peter said ministry of the word. But just the word ministry by itself, it can take on many different um, looks, many different avenues, many different uh, characteristics, right? And I, I put this little note here <clears throat> at the bottom to remind myself, again, to explain what ministry looks like in the kingdom of God. I'm going to use an extreme example. A kid, a Christian child, 10, 12 years old, is a minister of God. Every Christian is a minister of God because the word minister means servant. The word ministry means service. And every Christian is called to serve in some capacity. Every Christian is called to serve. Therefore, every Christian is a minister. Every Christian has a ministry. So what does, what does a child, a Christian child, what does their ministry look like? Well, let's look at their area of jurisdiction. What are they called to do at 10 or 11 or 12 or 8 or 9 years old? What are they called to do? Go to school. Uh, as, I, as I cogitated on the matter, I saw three specific areas of ministry for a Christian child. Three specific areas of ministry. One, you're called to um, be a student. Okay. You're not old enough. You're not mature enough to go to work. So you, that, that's, not a, that's not an area of jurisdiction that you have. You're not called to work. What are you called to do? Learn. At this period in your life, you're called to learn, to assimilate information. Okay? So when you go to school, that's ministry. How you conduct yourself at school, that's ministry. You are a servant of God, a servant of Jesus Christ. You represent Jesus Christ in your school. So what type, of, what type of student you are determines what type of servant you are, what type of minister you are in the kingdom of God. 
How do you apply yourself to your school work? How do you apply yourself to your homework when you come home? Do your parents have to always be behind you to do your homework? Or are you, do you take the initiative? What type of student are you? Are you obedient to the teachers? Are you helpful? <clears throat> what type of student are you? How do you apply yourself to learning? That's the quality of your service in the kingdom of God, because that's your area of jurisdiction as a Christian child. Okay. Second area at home. How do you relate to your parents and your elders? Are you respectful? Do you honor your mother and father? It's literally a command in the kingdom of God. It's a command. Or do you honor your mother and father? Are you respectful? Are you obedient? Do you shut down that um, video game and go to sleep? and prepare for bed at the right time? Or do your mother or your father have to be constantly behind you, telling you when to stop doing this and when to start doing that? Do you take the initiative? That's service, that's ministry. As a child, that is your ministry. And thirdly, how do you interact with your peers, your brothers and sisters, cousins, your friends at school and outside of school, neighbors and so forth? How do you interact with them? Are you a bully? Do you take advantage of people? Do you help people? Do you share Christ with people? You're old enough to know and to understand what the gospel of Jesus Christ is at that age. Jesus was 12 years old when he was in the temple discussing the, the Bible, discussing the scriptures with grown men who are the equivalent of PhDs. They were very learned men. And he at 12 years old was discussing the word of God with them. So, so your lack of age is not an excuse to be slack or lackadaisical in the body of Christ. Absolutely not. All right. As a matter of fact, I did a little research and I found that there were some kings in Israel, in, in over Judah, that started reigning at a very young age. And I'm going to just read us some notes I have here to sort of encourage the young people that might be watching this video in the next couple of weeks, months, years to come, whatever, right? Uzziah became the 10th king of Judah <clears throat> at the age of 16. He reigned for a total of 52 years, right? Under Uzziah's reign, the kingdom of Judah experienced incredible growth. Uzziah managed to conquer both the Philistines and the Arabians. He also fortified the defensive walls of Jerusalem by introducing machines designed by experts to shoot arrows and throw large stones at the enemies and did many exploits. Next, we have Josiah. Josiah became the 16th king of Judah at the age of eight years old. Eight. He reigned for 31 years. According to the Bible, he implemented many reforms, banning the official worship of several other gods other than Yahweh. All right. Also known for having compiled some very important Hebrew scriptures. And finally, Jehoash. <clears throat> Jehoash is the youngest king in the Bible. He began reigning at seven years old. Seven. He was the eighth king of Judah and reigned for 40 years. Jehoash is particularly known for having ordered the reconstruction of the temple. He did so by directing the money offered by the worshippers to funds aiming to repair the structure. However, in the 23rd year of his reign, he realized that the priest had failed to develop a proper restoration program. And as a consequence, he decided to implement his own plan, <clears throat> restoring the temple to its original condition. 16 years old, eight years old, seven years old, kings of Judah, right? You are not too young to serve God. You're not too young to have an impact in the kingdom of God. You're not too young to lead others into a relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? So at 10 years old, eight, nine, 10 years old, 12 years old, you are a minister of the gospel. You are a minister and you have a ministry. Your ministry is to be the best student you can be, to be the, the, the most obedient child that you can be to your parents and your elders, <clears throat> and to be an accurate, effective witness of Jesus Christ to your peers. Lead other young people to Christ. If you are saved, you are permanently saved. You can never lose your salvation. You're going to heaven. Guess what? The other kids in the neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, or in school, <clears throat> they may not be in your situation. All right? <clears throat> they may not be saved. They don't have a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. It is your job to lead them to Christ, get them saved, learn how to lead them to Christ. So one of the other uh, lessons we did 
a couple of weeks ago, I broke it down the Romans road and I showed you how to lead someone to Christ. Right? You won't hear. Go back and watch it. Lightandtruth.com. <clears throat> Check it out. Okay? So this is what ministry looks like in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Some people have the mistaken notion that um, titles impress God. Titles impress God. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Let me explain that to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes I hear, <laughs> you know, a man of God would be introduced. <clears throat> and I hear, um, <clears throat> uh, let's welcome to the podium, you know, Dr. Bishop, you know, Apostle, Prophet, you know, and they, you know, a whole long string of titles before the guy's name. Now, <clears throat> if somebody has <clears throat> done certain things and achieved certain things in life and they have a title to represent what they have achieved, I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. Okay, if you, you study for X amount of years and you're a doctor, is you should be called doctor, right? If you're a professor at a university, a professor, whatever. I have no problem with that. But I, I suspect that many, many people in the body of Christ, male and female, I think mostly male, they tend to get caught up in titles. <clears throat> you know, I'm minister XYZ, minister, so that just means servant, you know. <laughs> Every Christian is a minister. You know, it just means servant, that's all, right? I'm bishop, you know, doctor, you know, elder, overseer. These are just titles. They don't impress God. If an apostle doesn't do well as an apostle, he doesn't fulfill his duties as an apostle. He doesn't function properly in that office. He's called to be an apostle, but he doesn't do a good job. When at, at the judgment seat of Christ, when he stands before Jesus Christ, he's going to get very little rewards very little rewards and um, probably or possibly not reign in the kingdom of God during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ in the millennium on earth probably will not occupy a governmental position in Christ's government on earth because he failed. He did not do a good job as an apostle. On the other hand, you may have a single mom with three kids <clears throat> right? working two jobs, struggling to make ends meet. Right. But she has made it her business to accurately represent God. She's bringing up her children in the fear and, and admonition and nurturing in the Lord. Make sure each of them are saved, born again, personally led them to Christ as she should, as is the job and the responsibility of every Christian parent. I'll come back and touch on that in a while. All right. She may be uh, making time to fast and pray, making time to attend church at least once a week because she has to work so much. Can't go three times, maybe just once a week. All right, but she's doing what she needs to do to accurately represent Christ. Do you know that at the judgment seat of Christ, she will get a whole lot of rewards, crowns, and so forth? And in the millennial reign of Christ, she may form part of the government of God and planet Earth while the apostle might be under her. That's how the kingdom of God operates, people. God doesn't reward titles, He rewards faithfulness. How faithful you are to dispense the duties that He has given you. How faithful you are to dispense the duties consistent with the office, the ministry, the call of God upon your life. You're called to be a parent. Some people are called to be parents. That's it. Like this woman in my example, called to be a parent. <laughs> she may have, you know, whatever job that's not her call in life, just called to parent these three kids. And she did that to the best of her ability. Many rewards in the kingdom of God. The apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist who did not do a good job, not many rewards in the kingdom of God. So this is what ministry looks like in the kingdom of God, all right? Don't get caught up in titles and offices and so forth. God rewards faithfulness. Now, let me get back to this point here. And, and it's an extremely crucial point. And this is the point. Christian parent, watching this video, listen to my voice right now. Pay particular attention. Christianity is not absorbed through the skin. Christianity, you, someone does not become a Christian by osmosis. You don't absorb Christianity. Just taking your children to church doesn't mean they are saved. Christian parent, you who are actually born again, just growing up your children in the church culture, taking them to church, making sure they pray, making sure they read the Bible. All these things are great and wonderful and good. None of these things save them. None of these activities save them. Many, many Christian parents don't understand that. And so you have 
kids who grow up in church and the moment they reach 16, 17, 18 years old, they're gone. They're gone. Are you punch? They leave the church, leave everything gone. And they're living like the devil out there. They were never saved. They were never saved. Christian parent, it is your job. The moment your child is old enough to understand right from wrong, that may be a different age for different kids, right? One might be at seven, one might be at eight, one might be at nine, different ages for different kids. Once you discern your child is old enough to understand the gospel, it is your job, your responsibility, Christian parent, not the pastor, not the evangelist, your responsibility to put your child sit down and explain the gospel to them and personally lead them to Christ. Make sure they believe, they repent, and they are born again. Many, many Christian parents don't understand that. They think their responsibility is to bring the child to, to church, drag the child to church, and scream at them about praying and reading the Bible. And so that poor child grows up whole life, their whole life, right, in the church culture, very familiar with church culture. You understand? Maybe even in the choir and doing all sorts of things in the church, a part of the church. And the moment they leave and go off to college, that's it. They say bye-bye and they're gone. And they go and face those ungodly, some of those ungodly professors out there talking about evolution and atheism and all sorts of nonsense, humanistic, this, that, and the other, trans, this, that, and the other. And they mind get twisted and turned. And next thing they come out, they say there's an atheist. Why? Because I'm a free thinker. I started thinking for myself. They get on the internet and talk a pack of foolishness about I used to be a Christian, but now I, I, I see there's so many errors in the Bible and I'm no longer a Christian. Pack a tripe. A pack of tripe. You cannot be a Christian today and not be a Christian tomorrow. That's not the way born again works. I did a whole two videos on that on Facebook. Go check them out. All right? So this is what ministry looks like. If you're a Christian parent, part of your ministry is make sure your kids save, make sure they're born again. Let's press on. <clears throat> Every Christian has a general ministry and a specific ministry. The general ministry God gave to every Christian is reconciliation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second Corinthians 5, 18 says, And all things of God who had re reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? It is one of the nine attributes of salvation, by the way. Right? At some point, I'll do a whole series of teachings on the nine attributes of salvation. It's powerful and you need to, to know that. But reconciliation is to facilitate the reconnection of two alienated parties in mutual peace. So unsaved people are enemies of God. That's what the Bible says. If you're not saved, you're an enemy of God. There's no such thing as almost saved. Right? You're almost a Christian, almost. That's nonsense. <laughs> it is nonsense. You're either dead or you're alive spiritually. You're either on your way to hell or to heaven. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. Having his nature. Right? Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, you are children of the devil. Jesus said that. Okay? <laughs> so, so if you have a problem with me saying people are children of the devil, go talk to Jesus. Go read your Bible. Right? Some people are children of the devil. Right? Because they, they, they imitate him. There's no such thing as being almost a Christian. So, so to reconcile people is to bring people out of darkness into light. Right to lead them into the kingdom of God. That's the ministry of reconciliation. Every Christian has that ministry. <clears throat> this is the progression of the ministry of reconciliation. This is the way it works. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Live the life. Represent Jesus Christ by your lifestyle. Everything about you should say, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a man of God, a woman of God. All right? Look at me. When you look at me, you should see Christ. Live. Let your light so shine. That's the first level or first phase or stage of the ministry of reconciliation. Living in such a way that people will want to emulate your lifestyle. Second, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now you've got to talk to people now. Tell them about Jesus. Share the gospel with people. You know, bring good counsel. Speak a word of wisdom, right? Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations doesn't always mean ponging people over the head with the Bible and trying to get them you know, to, to come to church or get saved or make a confession. It could be something as simple as just giving somebody some good counsel. Like some friend of yours might be in a, a, a difficult um, relationship with someone. Right. And they need just good, good advice. 
you as a Christian, you're supposed to be reading and studying your Bible. So you're supposed to be able to readily give that person good biblical counsel and lead them, guide them, and direct them into the wisdom of God, <clears throat> right? The person might not be ready at that moment to make a decision to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. They may not be there yet, okay? But they need your help in other areas. Don't always be ready to just get somebody saved or drag them to church. Be a friend. Be a friend. <clears throat> Meet people where they are. <laughs> Meet people where they are. Right, and just be a friend. One of the most cringy, cringe, cringiest things for me as a Christian is other Christians who are so super, super zealous, you know, that I mean, they can't have a normal conversation with people. Everything is a scripture verse, everything is a scripture verse. Hey, he's up. <laughs> I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and sometimes some of the Christians just offend me. Because they can't, it's like they're super religious. And these people, as I said it, really and truly, many of these Christians, I, I hate to say it, but it's true. It's, they're not really being led by the spirit of God. You know? They're being led by a spirit of religion. They're fanatics, religious fanatics. And the spirit of religion is a demon. It's a demonic spirit. Understand this, people. I didn't plan to go here. I'm just being led by the Holy Spirit. The spirit of religion is a demonic spirit. It's not God, it's not the Holy Spirit. And you can tell the difference. The spirit of religion tends to compel and push and force. It's a spirit of extremes. It's always want to go into extreme uh, behavior, extreme. Everything is extreme. The spirit of God is not like that. The spirit of God is meek and gentle and friendly. People love to be in Jesus' presence. Little children would run after him. You know, men, women, young, old, everybody loves to be with Jesus, except the religious. Think about it. <laughs> the only people who did not like Jesus' presence was the religious people, the scribes and Pharisees. <coughs> Excuse me. You know why? Because religion is a demon. It's a demonic spirit. And so it clashes with the Holy Ghost. It, 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 the two spirits can't meet at all. So sometimes you meet some Christians and they greet you the wrong way. They greet you the wrong way. They just, just grow, they like sandpaper on your spirit. Why? They're being led by a demonic spirit of religion. <clears throat> okay? And these people, they tend to, they, they think they're doing a great service when they beat people over the head with the scriptures. No, you're, you're driving people away from the kingdom of God. <clears throat> you're running people away from Christ. Don't do that. Don't do that. Right? as seasoned, mature Christians who are accurately and effectively representing Christ, we ought to be friendly, right? approachable. Right? People ought to you know, want to be in our presence. <coughs> Excuse me. All right? Come to us for counsel. You know? And we ought to be able to give them a good word in due season. Right? Like golden apples and silver trees. Bless God. Right? So go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's the second level of reconciliation. First, you live the life, then you go tell people. <clears throat> but there's a third level, and you find it in Jude 123. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. This is a far more aggressive way of ministering to people. How do you rescue people by snatching them from the flames of judgment? Let's look at some of the Greek words. Rescue is the word sozo. <clears throat> it means to save from the evils which obstruct the reception of the messianic deliverance. That's a mouthful. To save from the evils which obstruct the reception of the messianic deliverance. So there are some people out there and they are being blinded. The Bible literally says some people are blinded by the devil and he takes them captive to do his will. Okay? So our job is to rescue them from the blindness that is preventing them from seeing the gospel and understanding the principles of the kingdom of God. How do you do that, right? It's very difficult to try and talk somebody out of that condition. I've tried it years ago when I didn't understand the difference. Try to talk people out of blindness. Mm -mm, you can't. You have to pray them out of it. You have to pray them out of it. That's intercession, people. That third level of reconciliation, that's intercession right there. Look at the word snatching. Is the word harpazo. It's the same Greek word used for the rapture to be caught up into heaven. Same word. It means to seize, to carry off by force, to claim for oneself eagerly. 
<clears throat> to claim for oneself eagerly. How do you do that? You in prayer, you say, Lord Jesus, my unsaved relative, my, my cousin, my, my uncle, my son, my daughter, my whatever, right? Or you call them by name, you know, Bob or Fred or Harry or whatever. <clears throat> you call them by name. You say, I claim that person for the kingdom of God. You lay claim to that person for the kingdom of God. You lay claim to them. <clears throat> that is what's snatching her part. So that's what it means. It's right there to claim for oneself eagerly, right? We can actually intercede for our loved ones by naming them, calling their names and saying, Lord, I lay claim to this person's soul for the kingdom of God. And you lay claim, you put a, a mark on them, you put a claim on that person, right? And you intercede before God for that individual. Okay, that is how we fulfill Jude 123. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. It is an aggressive, violent thing. All right, and let's go to the next slide and it will show you more scriptures to support that. All right, the ministry of reconciliation needs intercession. All right, look at what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twelve 12 in the Amplified Bible. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent assault and violent men seize it by force as a precious gift. <clears throat> the phrase suffers violent assault is biatso. It means to force, oppress, to crowd it oneself into. So from the days of John the Baptist to the time Jesus made this statement, a lot of people were forcing their way into the kingdom of God. There was a rush for the kingdom of God because both he and John the Baptist came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. People were responding to that call and they were forcing their way into the kingdom of God. He says, violent men taken by force. Violent men is the word biastes, biastes, right? It means strong, forceful, and energetic. <laughs> strong, forceful, and energetic. When you are praying intercessory prayers, it's not bless me, gentle Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. That's not how you pray intercession. No, no. You're coming directly up against the forces of darkness. Demons and devils have people's minds and blindness. They're binding people. They're literally holding people hostage by, by, by wrong thoughts in their mind, wrong ideologies and philosophies. You understand? There are strongholds in people's mind, thought patterns and structures, ideologies and philosophies that are contrary to the kingdom of God. Atheism, evol um, evolution, all these things, all these uh, trans things and all these different genders and all this nonsense. All these are strongholds in people's mind, right? Errors in the Bible. These are strongholds. You understand? And <clears throat> offenses, people are offended, right? by the, the actions of Christians, all these are strongholds in the minds of the unsaved. And <clears throat> we have to intercede for these individuals uh, aggressively from a position of authority and really go into the spirit realm and do warfare, do battle for these individuals, for our, our unsaved relatives and loved ones, and take them by force out of the kingdom of the devil and bring them into the kingdom of, of light with us, into the kingdom of God with us. You understand? It's an aggressive thing. <clears throat> the phrase take by force, again, is her part. So to snatch out of and to snatch away. So see your unsaved friends, family, loved ones, whatever, co-workers, neighbors, see them <clears throat> on their way to hell. Because literally that's what's happening to them. Spiritually, they're on their way to hell. They die today or tomorrow, they're in hell. Right? And again, people, those of us who are born again, Please be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. You have unsaved loved ones, right? And they may be wonderful, wonderful human beings. Wonderful human beings. Sterling character. Loving, kind, generous to fault, right? None of these things are going to prevent these people from going to hell. None of these wonderful characteristics. None of these beautiful personalities that they have. They, they, it cannot stop them from going to hell. They must understand the gospel, they must believe it and they must repent <clears throat> and make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. They have to repent. It is your job to make sure that happens. That's your area of jurisdiction. Ministry as an adult, <clears throat> that's your area of jurisdiction. Right? The people that you know, your friends, family, whatever, they are, they are they're put in relationship with you so that you can have an influence over their life. Okay? 
And so we have to pray. We have to do these three things that we mentioned in the previous slide. Live the life so they can see a light shining. Tell them about Jesus. Share good counsel with them, all right, whenever you can. And, and thirdly, pray and intercede for them, okay? And those of you on the call who might not yet have made that decision to serve Jesus Christ, to repent, to believe the gospel, to accept him as your Savior and Lord, tomorrow is not promised to you. The next breath is not promised to you. You have no hold on tomorrow. None of us do. No one has a claim on tomorrow, right? Preachers say this all the time from the pulpit. This is not a scare tactic. It's facts. <laughs> it's facts, right? Almost nobody's going to die tomorrow, plan to die tomorrow. <laughs> you understand? Most of the people who are going to die tomorrow, they have no plans to die tomorrow. They plan to live for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. That's their plan. Many of them are not going to wake up tomorrow. This is not a scare tactic. It's a fact. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do not, do not let the sun go down. In some places, sun already go down. Don't close your eye tonight without making Jesus your Savior and Lord if you're not yet saved. Let's press on. <clears throat> I'm going to go through this. Right? Time is so much upon us already. Right? I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I sort of looked at Abraham and um, his um, <clears throat> intercession for the people of Sodom as a pattern of what intercession looks like. Remember, we are trying to answer the question, is intercession a specific ministry? That's the question we're trying to answer. And I told you at the very beginning, we're going to go through, we're going to meander and go through some different parts. And I'm going to try to give you information so that you can make your own decision if intercession is an actual ministry, right? That's how we do in this Bible study. So I plan to go through this, but time is upon us. So I can't go through it in a whole lot of details. So I'll just hit the high points, right? The scripture verse or verses is Genesis 18, 17 to 33. You will need to go and read it on your own time and get the full thing. But God was about to rain judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And he told Abraham, all right, God appeared. All right, that is Jesus Christ appeared in physical form with two angels, right? Three men appeared to Abraham, was, was the Lord Jesus Christ in physical form and two angels, okay? When they were about to leave, the two angels turned to go and Abraham stood before the Lord, right? The first point I have here is that successful intercession proceeds from a covenant relationship. God said, should I hide this thing that I'm going to do from Abraham? No, let me do a hiding for him. Let me tell him, let you know, explain to him what I'm going to do <clears throat> because I know the man. I know the character of the man, right? I'm, I'm paraphrasing what all these scripture verses here say. Okay. So my first point is successful intercession proceeds from a covenant relationship. All right. <clears throat> then the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous. I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. <clears throat> this is what God told it is telling Abraham. <clears throat> All right. In verse 22, it says, And the men turned their faces from thence, that's the two angels, uh, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord, and Abraham drew near. So, what stood before the Lord? What does that mean? It, it, the, the idea that I got, the, the, the impression the Holy Spirit laid upon me is that intercessors place themselves between God and those he's about to judge. <laughs> Right? We're looking at the nature of intercession. What is intercession? In order to determine if intercession is a specific ministry, we're not looking at the nature of intercession. And this is the first thing I noticed. Right? Actually, the second thing. Right? Intercessors place themselves between God and those he's about to judge. It says Abram drew near. Right? This tells me that intercessors understand the proper protocol for entering God's presence. He drew near. He understand, you got to understand the proper protocol for entering God's presence. Psalm 100, 2 and 4 says, um, <clears throat> come before the Lord with singing. That word singing actually means uh, a joyful shout. All right? It says, uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. That's how you come before God. Right? That's a pattern on how to approach God. In verse 25, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is a question that Abraham asked God. 
and this by this I understand intercessors hold God accountable to his word this is extremely powerful to be an effective intercessor you have to know the word of God you have to know the nature of God the character of God you have to have a relationship and a fellowship with God because you have to be able to ask him some uh, questions and make some demands on him and put some things to God this is the nature of intercession Abraham stand before God. He prevented God from moving, right? Our page says he stood yet before the Lord. <laughs> he, in other words, he blocked God from moving. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> an intercessor, the power of an intercessor is to stop God from moving or to point God in a certain direction. <clears throat> There's a certain scripture in the Old Testament. God says, command ye me, command me. I think he's specifically talking to intercessors when he says that command me we have the power the authority to command god how by intercessory prayer <laughs> let's press on i wish i had a whole i wish i had two hours to go through all of this in detail with you <laughs> abram answered and said behold now i have taken upon me to speak unto the lord which am but dust and ashes <laughs> all right i have taken upon me that phrase in the in the um in the hebrew is yael yael it means to acquiesce the acquiesce is to do something that you're not really so totally joyful about doing, but you realize it's a necessity, so you're going to do it anyway, to acquiesce, all right? So I realize intercessors understand that intercession is a grave responsibility. It's something that needs to be done. Somebody needs to do it, all right? Intercessors have that sense of uh, responsibility about them. <clears throat> Amber, dust, and ashes. Right, that phrase tells me that intercessors approach God's th throne boldly, but with humility. You see, the Bible says, "Come before the throne of God boldly to receive grace and mercy in our time of need." So yes, come before the throne of grace boldly, but with humility. See, there's a saying: familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. You could become so close to somebody in authority that you you start to disrespect the individual because you're so close to them that is something that we have to guard against and be very very careful with that be extremely extremely careful with that <laughs> my my um my first pastor <clears throat> is this is a negative testimony it's unfortunate but um just before i left the church the first church that i attended <clears throat> just before i left the church god had given me a prophetic word to give to my pastor and i gave him the word when i gave him the word uh, it was a word of warning, by the way. God is warning him about certain things because he was going he was going out of the will of God and God wanted to warn him to come back in line. And God gave me a word, I delivered it. And to my great surprise, he told me, he says, I know that this word is directly from God. I say, how? Oh. He says, because this is the second time I'm getting this same word. Somebody has given me this word a month ago. And I was like, what? <laughs> Another faithful sister in the Lord in the church, one of the members gave him that word, right? And then a month later, God gave me the same, but I didn't know. God gave me the same word to give him. I did word for word, right? Both myself and the sister gave the, our pastor that word. It was a word of warning because he was going out of the will of God. To my great surprise, after he got that word a month ago, then got my word, right? He acknowledged it was, was from God. Sunday morning, that man got up on the pulpit and this is what he said. I got a word from God, you know, and it was confirmed. And, you know, and, and you know, God was warning me about certain things. But, you know, you had to know how to talk to God. This is what he's saying. Sunday morning worship service from the pulpit. He's saying, I've been serving God 20 something years or 23 or whatever. It's 23 years. And, you know, I have a relationship with God. And you have to know how to talk to God. And God can't talk to me. So after I serve him faithfully, he can't come and say this and that. that. And he, that he went off on God in front of the congregation. I tell you something, I felt like, man, <laughs> like judgment was about to land. <laughs> I started to feel like, I don't know, like I should, I, this is somewhere I, I don't need to be here. <laughs> and I petitioned God, I saw God and God had me to move from that church. It wasn't long after that judgment actually hit and the church, mo or, or most or all of the, the leaders uh, left the church and it just, you know, crumbled to nothing. So, um, you have to be very careful. Familiarity breeds contempt. This is a man of God who I love the man. I love his family. He's my first pastor. Love him to pieces. 
I tell you, God, after I left the church, I tried praying for him. God forbade me from praying for the man. God, the Holy Spirit, literally forbade me from praying for him. Because God knew if I prayed for him, he would answer the prayer. God wanted to bring judgment. It was time for judgment. Um, familiarity breeds contempt. Be very, very careful when you're approaching God that you don't mistake intimacy and you think that you have reached somewhere with God where you can disrespect God. Don't, don't ever, ever get into that position. An intercessor, the ministry of intercession is such that you get very close with God. I can tell you, I've been an intercessor for, for most of my life as a Christian. <clears throat> and God has given me so many prophetic words to give to people over the years, personal things about people. God will reveal things to you. God will reveal things about himself as an intercessor and take you in, into his personal <clears throat> space and reveal things about himself. And if you're not wise, you could tend to get in the condemnation my ex-pastor got into, thinking that God will make some exception for you. No, he, he would not. He's still God. He's still awesome. He's still fearful he's still <clears throat> a consuming fire and <clears throat> you know as i said that <laughs> just let's look at the last piece down here <laughs> right abram said um oh let not the lord be angry and i will speak will study <laughs> right and the word angry here is hara hara right it needs to be hot furious to burn <laughs> intercessors put themselves at risk on behalf of others <laughs> uh god is so good Right. Um, I'm reminded at this point of of uh, Prophet Moses, you know, Moses had an anger problem <clears throat> at the beginning of his ministry. He has slayed an Egyptian and um, God took him 40 years in the wilderness to train him, to bring him to, to the condition of meekness where he could actually be used by God. 40 years he trained him. He prepared him. He sent him to, to Pharaoh. He did his thing 40 more years. He, you know, delivered the Israelites, took them in the wilderness and whatnot. And at the end, at the end of Moses' ministry, you know, that anger rose up again. And God told him, speak to the rock. Moses didn't speak to the rock the second time. He whacked the rock with his rod and said, must we, must we bring water for you? Mm -mm. God said, that's it, Moses, you're done. Bam. He told Moses, set your house in order, you're dead. And he took Moses home. That was the end of Moses' ministry, right? Moses... For, for 80 years, 40 years in training, then 40 years in ministry. 80 years that man walked with God. Moses intercede for Israel. You know how many times God said, I'm going to wipe out Israel because they're so disobedient? Moses said, no, 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 don't wipe them out, Lord. And Moses intercede for Israel so many times. But they get on Moses' nerves so much that at the end of that, when God told him, speak to the rock, he just slipped for one moment and he let his anger get the better of him. And he says, must we, he equate himself equal with God. Must we fetch water for you out of this rock? And that was Moses' slip up. Familiarity breeds contempt. God spoke to Moses face to face, like a man speak to his friend. And because of that, because of all the abundance of revelation that God gave him, he slipped and he allowed familiarity to breed contempt. And he equated himself equal <clears throat> with God. And allowed his flesh, the anger, to rise up. And he whacked the rock. He hit the rock with his rod. Instead of speaking to it, he hit it. And he said, must we fetch water for you, disobedient, rebellious Israelites? And God said, that's it. You're done. So intercessors put themselves at risk on behalf of others. Right? Remember, one of the very first things I said is intercessors put themselves between God and those he's about to judge. <clears throat> So as an intercessor, you are literally standing there and facing the judgment of God, blocking the judgment of God from hitting X, Y, Z. And you are standing in the gap. That's what intercession literally means, to stand in the gap. All right? <clears throat> Let me speed this up and bring this in. Verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not <clears throat> the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. All right, verse 33, and the Lord went his way. <clears throat> Moses said, I will speak yet, but this once. In other words, this is the last time I'm going to, you know, ask you anything. This is the last time. And after Moses said, peradventure, 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy for 10 sake. God said, I will not destroy for 10 sake. And God left. <laughs> Notice carefully, God did not give Abraham another chance to speak. <laughs> 
God didn't give him another chance to speak because he already said, I, I will speak yet, but this once. That means this is the last time I'm going to ask you anything. That's what Abraham said, right? God took Abraham at his word. <clears throat> so what that teaches me is that God listens. When you're interceding, when you're praying, God listens attentively to your words. And God takes you at your words. He, he treats you very seriously when you're interceding. Because Abraham told him, <clears throat> this is the last time I'm going to speak. And after he spoke, God said, okay, I won't destroy it for 10. And God left. That was the end. <laughs> God didn't wait for anything else. That was the end. <laughs> right? So God pays attention to what you're saying and he takes your word very seriously. And finally, um, it says he left communing with Abraham. The word communing here is the word uh, daver, daver. Yes, you pronounce it be like a V, just like in Spanish. Daver, right? It means to promise. So everything that God said here during the intercession, it was a promise. God promised to do these things, right? So this is the nature of intercession. We use Abraham's uh, intercession for Sodom as an example, right? <clears throat> so what we've been doing up to this point is just basically laying the groundwork and showing you what is a ministry, right? Um, it's a call. Uh, there's a general ministry of reconciliation that every Christian has, right? Everybody's a minister. Minister just means servant, right? You're called to serve, whether you're young, old, male, female, doesn't matter, right? We looked at the nature of intercession, right? As an intercessor, what is expected of you? We looked at Abraham's example here, right? So now we're going to answer the question, is intercession a specific ministry? Is it? Um, and the thing we have to know is this. Every born-again Christian has a specific ministry, all right. I just showed you that everyone has a general ministry of reconciliation. Everyone has a specific ministry as well. All right. So <clears throat> I'm looking at the rest and I don't want to keep you too long. All right. I don't want to keep you too long. All right. So this is what I'll do. I'll just read through this quickly. All right. And bring this in for a close. Romans 12, 48. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. All members have not the same office, which means every Christian has a different call upon their life, right? And you may have many different Christians who are evangelists, or many different Christians who are pastors, or apostles, or whatever. No two ministries are going to be identical. Even if you have two apostles or two pastors or, or 10 pastors or 100 or 1,000 pastors, no two are going to be exactly alike. Everyone has a specific call upon their life. This you have to understand, right? And not even those who are called to the fivefold ministry, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist, not even those. I talk about all everybody else in the body of Christ. No matter what you're called to be or to do, right? It will be specific to you. There's a, there's, there's a work, a job that God has called you to do that no one else can do but you. If it, if you don't do it, it won't be done. That's why you're going to be rewarded for doing it. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? <laughs> Let's read a little further. But since we have special gifts which differ in accordance with the diversified work graciously entrusted to us, if it is prophecy, let the prophet speak in exact proportion to his faith. If it is the gift of administration, let the administrator exercise sound judgment in his duties. The teacher must do the same in his teaching, exercise sound judgment. And he who exhorts others in his exhortation, he who gives should be liberal. Remember earlier on, I showed you those um, uh, 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 disciples who, fi who were financially well off and they sent relief to those who were broke. And I said the word relief, relief is the word uh, diakonia. It means ministry or service. Look at this scripture here, right? He who gives should be liberal. You see, we're talking about offices. All members have not the same office. And the Bible is saying that giving money is an office, is an actual ministry. What does that tell us? It tells us that God will bless some people financially just so that they can support the body of Christ. Give money to the body of Christ. And that is a ministry. Just giving money is a ministry. <laughs> Praise God. All right? Um, <clears throat> the need for intercession. The need for intercession. All right? And we're going to close off here. Isaiah 59, 16 in the Amplified Bible says, He saw, that's God, He saw that there was no man 
and was amazed that there was no one to intercede. King James says there was no intercessor, right? There was no one to intercede on behalf of truth and right. God was amazed that there was no intercessor. Now, Isaiah is right in this, and Isaiah is a prophet. So God had a prophet, right? And then Amos was also a contemporary of Isaiah. So God had more than one prophet to Israel. He had Isaiah, he had Amos, he had prophets. But yet still he was astonished. And the word amaze here, right, can be translated as astonished, horrified. <laughs> he was horrified. He was astonished. He was amazed, right? It, was, it, it affected him really, really terribly that there was no intercessor, so you tell me if intercession is a specific ministry <laughs> when God is astonished, amazed, and quite frankly, horrified that there was no intercessor, right? He was astonished that there was no intercessor, right? <clears throat> so you, you, you answer that question for yourself. Hebrews 7.25, he is also able to save forever. Uh, writer of Hebrews is speaking about Jesus. He's also able to save forever, <clears throat> Right, right here. This is another reason why you cannot lose your salvation because he's able to save forever <laughs> those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Man, this is a powerful scripture verse. Hebrews 7:25. The writer of Hebrews is saying Jesus Christ is able to save forever, permanently. Those who come to God through him, why? How he's able to save them forever? Because he's always interceding for them so that their faith can never fail. He already doesn't give them a perfect faith. Now he's praying for them so that their faith will never fail and they will remain safe forever. Some people still believe you can lose your salvation. Well, boy, Jesus had to be some kind of weird individual because he prayed for you constantly in heaven that you remain safe. And you saying he his prayers being failed. He, he prayed prayers that not being answered at all. So I don't know what kind of savior he is. <laughs> the fact, people, is that no, you cannot lose your salvation. You're saved forever. Why? Because Jesus is ever living to make intercession for all of us. Here's the thing. <clears throat> right now in heaven. Jesus is occupying the office of a high priest, right? <clears throat> Jesus occupied three main offices, prophet, priest, and king. They correspond to the past, the present, and the future. When he came on earth physically, he was a prophet of God, right? Moses said, God would raise up a prophet like unto me. Here he is. He is speaking about Jesus, right? Jesus is coming again as king of kings and lord of lords. So when he comes in the future, he'll come as king to reign for a thousand years in the millennium. But right now, he is the priest, a high priest. So he has one job right now, intercession. The only thing Jesus has been doing for 2,000 years is praying for you and I. You tell me, intercession. You, you answer the question for yourself, is intercession a specific ministry? <laughs> right? The Bible teaches us that Jesus is only praying for us, been praying for us for 2,000 years. Most of what he's doing is praying. Then the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God as their children. Imitate God. Jesus Christ is God. Imitate Jesus Christ. And he has been praying nonstop for 2,000 years. Right? So is intercession a ministry? You answer that question for yourself. All right? I'll leave you with this example of great intercessors, Daniel Nash and Abel Clary. Go read about them. I just did it on the internet. <clears throat> right? For time, I wouldn't go into a whole lot. But um, Charles G. Finney is one of the greatest evangelists of our time. Him and Dwight L. Moody are two of the most well-known evangelists of several hundred years ago, right? In more recent times, you have people like Billy Graham and Bill Britt and some of these people, right? But when you talk about really great evangelists, Charles G. Finney. Charles Finney used to walk into a town and the liquor stores would shut down, the bar rooms would shut down, the brothels, the prostitute house, but they would just shut down. People would just start to repent. And he started to preach yet. He just walk into the city. <laughs> they should make a movie of this man's life, right? He walked into a factory one time, and as he walked into the factory, one by one, people just fall on the ground and start to repent, just start to repent, just by seeing him, <laughs> right? He won hundreds of thousands of souls for Christ, and most of the people, 80% of the people that he won to Christ stayed Christians, hardly anybody backslide. He preached repentance. He's an extremely powerful evangelist. No, <clears throat> here's the thing about Charles G. Finney that many people might not know. He had two men, personal intercessors. He called them armor bearers, personal intercessors. 
All right, Daniel Nash and Abel Clary. Daniel Nash used to call him Father Nash. He would go into a city before Finney ever went into the city. Daniel Nash would go into the city, rent a little place, and he would fast and pray for that city for days, weeks, sometimes months. All he would do is pray, 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 intercede for that city until he felt a note of victory in his spirit. He and Abel Clary, they would go in and they would do warfare. They would battle the forces of hell and snatch the souls, rescue them by snatching them out of darkness into light. And they would win the battle in the spirit realm until he felt that the spirit of God was saying, they're ripe. The place is ripe. Then he would send note. He would send a message to Charles Finney to come. The place is ready. That is when Charles Finney would walk into the town. And went, boop, 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 boop. People would just drop down and repent. Do you understand? The power behind Charles G. Finney's ministry, evangelistic ministry, was the intercession of Daniel Nash and Abel Clary. You don't believe me? After Daniel Nash died, Charles G. Finney's ministry just fizzled out. <laughs> In a couple of weeks, right, a month or two, the ministry fizzled out. That's after many, many years of powerful ministry. So it, it wasn't like it was a bad thing. The time had come. Right? But after Daniel Nash died, Charles G. Finney's ministry just, just dried up. All right? So <clears throat> you answer the question for yourself. Is intercession a specific ministry? Right? I leave it up to you to answer. Right? How do you identify your ministry if you think you might be an intercessor or whatever it is? Doesn't matter what. Right? The, the cry of many Christians is, how can I know what my call is? How can I know what my ministry is? Right? Romans eleven twenty nine says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So God equates the gifts and calling together. So your gifts help determine your call. What are your gifts? They are the natural and spiritual abilities you have been given by God. If you can identify your gifts, your natural ability, as well as your spiritual abilities, right? <clears throat> you may be able to determine what your ministry is. Okay? Um, so that's it, my friends. That's that's the word of God for you today. All right. Um, <clears throat> as I, I told you from the very beginning, I will leave the answer to that question up to you. You determine if intercession is a specific ministry or not based on the information that I presented here to you.